So I want to introduce our speaker. So Dr. Lauren Acker's Black Acker has come all the way down from Milledgeville just for us. So um, yes, thank you. We um, really appreciate her. But um, Dr. Acker is a lecturer at, in the Department of History and Geography at Georgia College and State University in Milledgeville. She received her BA in History from Cornell University and her master's and PhD in United States History from the University of California in Los Angeles. And it was during that time that I first got to meet her because she was coming um, into the city um, archives to do her research on um, Mayor Herman Meyer's administration, which was great because she was using a lot of records that hadn't been used very much before. So um, it was really nice to see those records get used, and I learned a lot about those records in that time period through her work. Um, her current research is focused on 19th century Southern history, and she's currently working on a book, manuscript entitled Savannah's New South, Race, Ethnicity, and the Making of a Modern City, 1880. 1910. So I'll let um, Dr. Acker take over. Hello. Uh, it's really great to be here. I um, want to thank Luciana for uh, giving me this opportunity and for also helping me when I was in graduate school uh, navigate the archives. I was from California and I'd only been in Savannah once before that, um, so I really didn't know what I was doing. So uh, it was really great uh, to work with her. And I'm especially excited because I've now spent quite a few years studying Herman Myers, illustrious mayor of Savannah, and it is uh, very exciting for me to get to talk to you about uh, talk about him to you today. Um, so if you haven't spent many years studying Herman Myers, which obviously I'm the only one in the room who has, um, then you probably have heard of him in connection to City Hall. Um, he is named on the historical marker for City Hall outside, and it was really his greatest achievement while he was mayor of Savannah. He served 10 years as a city alderman from 1880 into the 1890s, and then served 10 years as city mayor through the turn of the century. Looking at this building, which is pictured in this great postcard, it's hard not to think of Myers as this quintessential city father, a guy who helped build um, this incredible building devoted to improving his community. And this is sort of an image that the city of Savannah has cultivated uh, in a document collection produced to celebrate the centennial of City Hall. It talks about City Hall as, quote, a monument to the progressive spirit of the city of Savannah in a time when municipal governments strive to achieve a greater Savannah. And of course, with Herman Myers as the leader of municipal uh, force in this period, obviously we associate him with that really great achievement. And that's really, well, here's a great, great picture of Herman Myers, the one that I believe was on the, the poster for this talk. Um, but Herman Myers certainly wanted to be remembered that way as this great uh, civic father, uh, and his family definitely agreed. This is his very impressive uh, grave site uh, at Bonaventure Cemetery. And under the listing of his years as both an alderman and mayor that are printed on uh, the, this great uh, big tablet, it says, quote, his sympathetic love for all of mankind and lofty ideals of civic pride and virtue made his life a dedication to the betterment of his fellow man and the beautifying and advancement of his beloved city. His life's achievements have left enduring marks of his splendid work, which are imperishably linked with the history of Savannah. It is definitely true that his efforts are certainly intertwined very deeply with the history of Savannah, but not everyone, at least at the time or shortly after, would have given Herman Meyer such a kind remembrance. Uh, there's actually a great example here in the municipal archives um, that was in a time capsule that was actually in the municipal auditorium um, and it was opened in 1971 when the municipal auditorium was demolished uh, for the Civic Center that's now in that location. But in this time capsule there were a bunch of things including this 1916 paper um, that was really talking about prohibition. So it wasn't directly about Myers at all. It was about the issue of prohibition and trying to make sure uh, that Georgia legislatures weren't going to repeal some restrictions on liquor legislation. But within this discussion, they bring up Myers' administration as this dark time in the city's history, as a time of corruption and all these terrible things. They say that gambling was conducted openly in the business district without any intervention from the police that there was the stuffing of ballot boxes, and this is their words, with only superficial concealment, 
There were violence and threats of violence at the polls to try and keep people from voting against the Myers administration. There are apparently murders committed in open light of day, and also the forcible and illegal registration of immigrants to try and get them to then vote for uh, the Myers machine. According to this article, there was nothing short of a bloodless revolution required in order to get the Myers administration out of office. And when the decent element of Savannah finally rid themselves of the scourge of corrupt politicians. So, and it was bringing this up as a way to sort of galvanize Savannah voters to make sure that they wouldn't let um, new politicians in that would repeal these liquor laws. So obviously this is a very different take on Myers. We see him on one side as this incredible progressive local politician building this beautiful city hall. On the other side, this leader of this political machine in terrible time in Savannah's history. So the question for us today is how should we remember him? Should we remember him as this magnanimous engine behind city development or as a corrupt politician really using some of these opportunities in Savannah for his own ends? So to begin to answer that question, I'd like to backtrack and tell you a little bit about Herman Meyer's past. Well, in this way we can hopefully get a sense of who he was as a man. So Herman Meyers was born in Bavaria, Germany, uh, in the town of Illerichen, which is pictured with this nice red dot, sort of the general area. Um, and he came with his family in 1856 when he was nine years old to the United States. The Myers family was part of a very large wave of German immigration that came to the United States in the mid uh, 19th century. It really peaked in the 1850s when Myers was coming over with about uh, 200,000 migrants. And most of these German immigrants left home for lots of reasons we might expect, political turmoil, issues back at home, and they were hoping for greater economic opportunity here in the United States. Now, Herman Myers was in the Jewish community of Illerichen. It was a, a place that had a lot, a lot of Jews there. And they really left for a whole set of additional reasons. They were also looking for greater opportunity, but there was also a lot of persecution and issues they were facing in Germany. And so they came to the United States for greater religious freedom. So Myers' father came first, Samuel Myers. He came to the United States and moved to Virginia. And upon arrival to the country, Herman went with his mother and siblings to meet Samuel in Virginia. So once he was in the United States, he went to public school and he trained with his father, who was a tanner. And then Samuel died in 1861. And as we know from the date, right, this is right as the Civil War is getting started. So Herman Myers moves with his family, and he's only 14 years old at the time. He moves with his family to Lynchburg, Virginia, where he sort of helps the fam family economy keep going. Uh, the next we hear from him, he moves to Savannah in 1867, when he's 20 years old, with his two younger brothers, Sego and Fred. Now we assume that he moved for the reason that many people were moving around after the Civil War, which was for greater economic opportunity. This was a time of trying to get the country back on track after the Civil War, and there were a lot of opportunities for people who were commercially minded and savvy businessmen. So it did not take long for Herman Myers really to make a big stamp on the business community of Savannah. Uh, when he arrived in Savannah, he created a tannery business, which made a lot of sense because that was the, the trade that he had learned from his father. And this provided the seed money for a cigar and tobacco company that he started. After a short time, by the 1880s, Myers and his brothers had branches of their El Modelo Cigar Company. They had uh, branches in Richmond, in Tampa, and Jacksonville, Florida, as well as Havana, Cuba. With the money that he earned from that, he then created a grocery business and a wool textile business that would morph into the Savannah Grocery Company, uh, which became this big enterprise. You can see this is the main Savannah Grocery Company building. It was on Bay Street, pretty, pretty impressive edifice. Um, and you can see here there's a little uh, ad for the cigar company that he owned with his brothers as well. Um, and this is probably something that also spoke to some of the networks he had from back in Germany. Uh, the wholesale grocery business was actually a niche business for a lot of Jewish, German Jews who came uh, to, uh, over in the mid-19th century. So he probably sort of utilized some of those networks that he had built from coming over in order to build up this business. 
But networks aside, he was obviously a very talented businessman. Um, after opening all these various concerns, he entered the world of finance by organizing the National Bank of Savannah in 1885. And he acted as the president of that institution for over 20 years. And he did help construct this uh, National Bank building, um, which was considered to be one of the most impressive buildings in the city at the time. In addition to organizing the National Bank, he also uh, organized the, or was part of the directors of the Oglethorpe Sa Savings and Trust Company and the Savannah Fire and Machine Insurance Company. Um, he also invested in a lot of local railroads and streetcar companies, so he really had his hands in pretty much everything um, in terms of business and finance uh, in the city. And it's the breadth and the depth of these commercial and financial endeavors that really assured his reputation as this talented businessman and then paved the way for his entrance into local politics. Around the same time that he opened the National Bank, he was elected alderman for the first time uh, in Savannah. And he would be reelected consecutively for five terms for a total of 10 years. Throughout his tenure, he was on a lot of very important committees. He was a particular fixture on the Finance Committee. And so anything in the city that had to do with regulation of finances, you'd see Meyer's name attached. Uh, he also was pretty uh, adept at steering clear of some inter-party conflict that would happen at the city level. So even as different administrations came into office, he stayed as an alderman, which was not always the case. Sometimes when a new administration came in, they swept everybody out. Um, but he managed to stay in office. So it seemed like he really had the golden touch when it came to business, and certainly things were going very well for him in politics. But his personal life was not the same story. Um, and I like to tell the story of Meyer's first marriage and subsequent scandalous divorce, which I will get into in a minute, because it tells us a little bit about who he was as a person. Um, when you read his speeches, he comes across as this pretty dry guy. He was not known to be particularly eloquent, especially compared with some of the other local politicians. So it's pretty hard to get a sense of him. And I think that this incident, um, this marriage, gives us a little clue into who he was. So in April of 1890, Myers wed Miss Nellie Mae Deitch in a ceremony at Temple Mikvah Israel, and then they went to the DeSoto for a really lavish wedding reception with over 400 people. And by the way, this was seriously detailed uh, in the local news. Unfortunately, we don't have photos. I wish we did. We have incredible descriptions. But we know from the descriptions that they were wearing the fashions from Paris. Um, and, and all sorts of costly jewels. And so this is pretty much what they would have looked like. So Nellie May was the daughter of one of Meyer's business associates from the Savannah Grocery Company. She, like him, was Jewish, and she was also originally from Virginia. So it gives us a sense that he probably kept in contact with some of those uh, networks he had back in Virginia. The interesting piece is that she was significantly younger than him. Uh, by the time Myers got married, he was a pretty uh, seasoned bachelor. He was 43 years old, and Nellie May was over 20 years younger than him. So they have this lavish ceremony. Um, it's covered in the local press. The who's who of Savannah is there. But they were only married for a little over a year. And then all of a sudden, there is all this press, both in Atlanta and in Savannah. So there was interest in this issue all the way in Atlanta about an alleged impropriety that happened on Tybee Island when they were on vacation. And this led to a very scandalous and very public divorce. So when Nellie May filed for divorce, she alleged some interesting things. She said, quote, she, she was charging Myers with, quote, harsh conduct and language by Myers, charges of infidelity and unchastity, and that he persecuted his wife by placing her under surveillance of a detective and circulating base and false charges against her character. In addition to the damaging allegations against Myers, there was also a divorce bill demanding a substantial alimony payment. In 1891, the Superior Court of Savannah was packed for the divorce proceedings. Uh, Nellie May herself was not there. Uh, she had actually fled to New York um, after all of this happened. But her father was there and gave testimony. And he portrayed Myers as a calculating man who essentially drove his fragile young wife to the brink of insanity. And he also talked a lot about Myers' wealth and how he had accustomed Nellie May to quite a lavish lifestyle, sort of paving the way right for that substantial alimony payment. Um, 
Myers, for his part, claimed that he had evidence of his wife's infidelity. Um, unfortunately, I never found what that evidence was. But he said he had evidence, and he would produce it at the proper time. And then he said that he had had some bad business investments. He had been trying to get Nellie Mae to rein in her spending, but she was prone to extravagance. And therefore, he should not be able to, or should not have to, support her in a lavish lifestyle. I wish I could tell you what the actual final divorce settlement said. I have not been able to track that down. And it's in large part because this marriage has essentially been erased from the historical record. When you look at all the discussion of Myers through all his elections as mayor, in all of his um, you know, eulogies when he died, et cetera, there is no mention of this marriage at all. It has been erased. And we would think that this could really damage Myers politically, right? And I like to think probably he, you know, got a lot less invitations to fancy parties um, in Savannah after this happened. But ultimately, local Savannah voters, the, the public at large, clearly decided that Myers' utility to the government utility um, in local politics either you know, outweighed um, what he did in his private life, or they felt that you know, Nellie Mae was at fault. We'll never really know. But it does give us insight into the fact that you know, Myers was maybe not the sort of gregarious sort all the time, that that hard scrabble determination that had led to his political success, to his economic success, may have meant that he could have been a difficult person to deal with in person. Um, so even if Nellie Mae was prone to exaggeration, we have to think that there's, there's clearly something there. All right. So really, just a few years after this scandalous and public divorce, Myers is elected mayor of Savannah. And while he is mayor, he accomplishes quite a lot. Um, this is a, a great photo of a city council meeting. And it's in the city exchange, which is the building that was here before City Hall. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But there's Myers uh, in the back there, sitting. So when Myers came to office, he completely overhauled the city's bureaucracy, completely. He basically created all these new commissions that were meant to streamline all sorts of city services. And this is because part of the reason he got elected is people were very frustrated that there wasn't enough change happening in terms of the city's infrastructure. So he came in and created these new commissions to do that. He created a water commission that built a new electric plant and laid over 10,000 feet of new water mains. He also created a, a sort of overhauled the tax assessors and receivers office, helping to raise city revenues and also lowering the tax rate slightly after reassessing. He created a commissioner of public works position uh, that made sure that more streets were paved than the previous administration. Also uh, coordinated crucial improvements to the city's sewage system, which was very important in the late 19th century. He also helped collect a lot of data about what was happening in Savannah, you know, how many feet of streets were being paved and what material they were being paved, et cetera. So it's part of a you know, drive to really understand what the city needed and how he was going to go about uh, helping the city. He was the one that actually renumbered all the buildings in Savannah uh, with uh, Bull Street as the origin point. He reinvigorated the Chamber of Commerce and also was deeply involved with a lot of booster efforts. He was trying to get conventions. There were lots of pamphlets printed um, extolling the virtues of Savannah and why people should come and invest. Uh, he helped host the League of Georgia Municipalities Conference here in Savannah and gave everybody a tour of all the grand modern conveniences in the city. And very interestingly, he also appointed the first African-American city physician at this time which is something that was really desperately needed because this is also the time period where segregation laws are increasing. Um, there's an attempt to really um, sort of limit uh, the black population's access to services. And so the fact that he actually appointed, and I believe this is the first African American that was appointed um, since the Civil War, this was you know, a pretty interesting addition to his legacy. So with all these changes to the city's infrastructure, Savannah was prospering and transforming into a modern urban space. But of course, Herman Meyer's greatest achievement was the building of City Hall. So the new City Hall was designed by a local architect and later built by a local company. In addition, Myers was able to pay for City Hall over the course of three years without raising taxes. This was supposedly done through belt tightening and the reduction of department budgets, 
but according to the local press, this was proudly done without any sort of um, injury to the city's uh, functioning at the time. So here's, I think, a great photo of the city exchange. So it sat in this place in Savannah. And there was actually a lot of debate about whether or not we should demolish this in order to build a new city hall. Uh, and the colonial dames actually heavily protested uh, demolishing this building in order to build the newer, more modern city hall. But after a lot of debate, it was decided that you couldn't pick a better spot than this, right, for the seat of government. So they ultimately decided to demolish City Exchange, which was built in 1799, and use that site. And I love this picture because this is actually Herman Myers tipping his hat to the camera. So again, a little insight to who he was. Maybe he had a little bit of a jaunty side as well because uh, this seems like a pretty uh, fun picture. And then here's a picture of City Hall a few years after it was constructed. In this particular picture, it's decked out in flags for President Taft's visit uh, to Savannah in 1909. So during most of the time City Hall was under construction, everything was good for Myers and his faction. He had a lot of support from Savannah voters, and it was really a proud and patriotic moment for residents. Um, but this support and unity that he had at that time was actually really not characteristic of his time more broadly as a politician in Savannah, or at least as mayor. Myers and his political organization, called the Citizens Club, had entered Savannah politics in the 1880s as you know, good government reformers, people who were going to make city government more efficient. But he really created a lot of turmoil in the city at the time and lots of charges of corruption, um, particularly by the time he left office. Um, and we see that there's a lot of t discussion of some of the nefarious tactics he and his party engaged in, despite this idea of them being these good government reformers. When Myers first put himself forth as a candidate for the uh, mayoral seat in 1895, he completely shattered the unity of his political organization. The Citizens Club devolved into what they referred to in the local press into a battle royale um, within the organization. Uh, and there was all this discussion about who's going to be nominated. And it was suggested that Myers had engaged in a lot of um, unsavory activities to assure his nomination, including possibly buying off other people in the club. And even after he came into office and you know, he accomplished all these things, a lot of people were charging him as having two intentions with a lot of what he was doing. So I mentioned these great city commissions that were supposed to overhaul city government. Well, the commissioners were appointed and they were appointed for very long terms, and they had very little oversight by city council. So there was charges that you know, he came in saying that he was making things more efficient, but it was actually about entrenching his buddies in really important city offices. Because most of the people he appointed were businessmen who he knew through his business connections in the city. The controversy surrounding the commissions is the reason that Myers actually lost his second race for mayor. So if you notice, when you look at Meyer's terms in office, he was in terms for 1895 to 1897, and then from 1899 to 1907. And that's because he lost his second bid. And he lost to Peter Meldrum. Um, if you guys have heard of the Green Meldrum House, uh, this is that Meldrum. He was a uh, politician and lawyer in Savannah. And he had been part of a, uh, you know, the political opponents of the Citizens Club who charged, really used the commissions and the fact that these were sort of a nefarious thing uh, to really win the election uh, in 1897. Unfortunately, though, Meldrum's term did not go that great. Uh, he was not able to deliver on a lot of his prom promises to clean up city politics. So in 1899, Myers returned to office. He was elected again and would be elected for four consecutive terms after Meldrum. So things were good for a while, but especially as City Hall neared its completion, uh, neared its building towards 1905-1906, uh, tensions and suspicions mounted about Herman Myers and the Citizens Club hold on the city. Um, a lot of people started to charge that the Citizen Club, after being in office for so long, was just rife with corrupt people who were using the government to perpetuate their own in interests and power. One longtime politician in Savannah charged Myers with bossism and running the Citizens Club like a, quote, czar. 
Another local businessman in a letter published in the Savannah Morning News in 1905 informed Myers that he was out of touch with his constituency and the majority of Citizens Club officers were involved in city government for their own gain and not for the selfless purpose that people were supposed to be involved in city affairs. Specifically related to City Hall, rumors started to swirl that the contracts that had been used to build and furnish the building had not been based on really fair uh, criteria, that these contracts had actually not been based on low prices, but were friends of Myers, and that's how they got them. And there was a lot of debate about that, you know, inquests into what was going on with City Hall. And so tensions really started to grow as people were registering to vote in 1906 for the county elections. And they started to charge that Myers and his administration was actually interfering with the registration of voters. And so there was a lot of turmoil as people were coming to register. They charged that city officers and off-duty policemen were basically intimidating people, trying to prevent them from casting or from registering to vote. And Myers, in response, sort of went, sorry. Uh, he basically said that he would try and put some officers there to regulate what was going on in the courthouse, but that, you know, these people were off duty, he couldn't really intervene, so too bad, so sad, was basically his response. Um, and this only served to increase tensions and actually led to deadly violence. In February of 1906, six men fired more than 40 gunshots in front of City Hall leaving one dead and four seriously wounded. And there are differing accounts of the incident that make the details of this, quote, affray very murky, but definitely partisan conflict and growing frustration with Myers and his corrupt administration is really what caused it. Now, the incident was initiated by the Dyer brothers, and I wish I was making up what their names are, but I'm not. They went by Babe Dyer, Sap Dyer, and Snatcher Dyer. Um, so the Dyer brothers were what we refer to as political healers. So their job was to basically go out, pull people out of saloons, and get them to go register to vote. And they had had some altercation in the previous days with the city's plumbing inspector, who was also an administration supporter. So the implication was, you know, they might have gotten in the way of the Dyer brothers in trying to register some people who were going to support their faction. So what happened? So if we just imagine the scene in front of City Hall, the city plumbing inspector gets off of a streetcar, goes to walk up the steps of City Hall, and Babe Dyer approaches him and hits him over the head with a club. Him and the rest of the Dyers then start beating the city plumber senseless until four more city employees then jump into the um, the melee to try and you know, save their colleague. And this included two policemen, the harbor master, and his clerk. We're not quite sure how the shots started being fired, but they were fired by both parties. A detective also joined the fracas, shooting Sap Dyer when he wouldn't drop his pistol when ordered, and at least one innocent bystander was also wounded. So, you know, it's sort of a, in retrospect, kind of unbelievable uh, incident on the steps of City Hall, but it was really symptomatic of the frustration, right, the, 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 the intense feeling uh, among people locally against Myers and his administration. So as you might imagine, after this, what support Myers had eroded pretty significantly in, in the coming months. Uh, his city council tried to scramble to sort of keep hold of things, and they thought that they would start investigations into various departments to try and prove that actually this administration was not corrupt, but that didn't go so well either. Um, basically, these investigations turned up a lot of dirty dealings. Um, we have, um, let's see, a justice of the peace, a friend of Myers, was accused of malpractice and fired for his actions. Uh, investigations started with the cemetery keeper and the clerk of council. Both were charged with skimming funds in one form of an, or another. But the worst was definitely the inquiry into the city's police department. And this resulted in a very unflattering report on the lack of discipline and professionalism in the police force. So Myers also opened himself up to charges of corruption because of his very tepid support for liquor laws in the city. So in the early 1900s, 
you know, prohibition was an issue that was a big deal, particularly in the South. And this county in Savannah was actually a wet county. So you could actually have um, bars open, but there were certain restrictions and you had to have liquor licenses. So Myers would enforce Sunday blue laws, but he really never supported any extension of the regulation of liquor laws in the city. And this became a big issue for people who saw themselves as reformers um, in the city at the time. Now, likely the reason that Myers did not support restriction of liquor laws was because he actually invested in a distillery <laughs> and he also sold liquor out of the Savannah Grocery Company. But there's also a connection to his Jewish heritage as well. Um, typically, because Jews use alcohol in their religious practice, Jewish communities in the United States during the Prohibition debate typically came out against those sorts of restrictions. Um, and also, distilling and selling of liquor was also part of the niche industry that a lot of Jewish immigrants ended up in as well. So really, people started to distrust Meyer's stance on this and believe that he really didn't have any meaningful desire to curb uh, alcohol use in the city and all of the you know, bad things that went on in saloons that people wanted to stop. Another sort of interesting piece or sort of part of Meyer's sort of backdoor dealings is a little harder for us to categorize. It actually may have been the case that Myers used some of his business connections to postpone the segregation of the city's streetcars. So throughout 1890s into 1900s, throughout the South, segregation laws are being passed. And a lot of these laws are targeting public transportation, specifically streetcars. In the 1870s, black residents in Savannah had protested attempts to segregate streetcars and had won. So the city had integrated transportation all the way through to the 1900s. Throughout Meyer's administration, there were a couple of attempts to pass local ordinances or to pressure the local streetcar companies to segregate the streetcars. And each time, the black community responded with a boycott. But it actually seems that Meyer's own investment in these streetcar companies and his power um, as mayor led him to get most of these streetcar companies to continue to leave them integrated because he didn't want to lose revenue through these boycotts. And it doesn't seem like a coincidence that the final time that the uh, street court ordinance was finally passed was when Myers was actually out of town. So Myers actually went on his second honeymoon with his second wife. Uh, he left town in December of 1906. And while he was gone, the acting mayor and city council passed an ordinance that segregated the street, city streetcars. So it gives the message that he was potentially one of the roadblocks that was preventing that from happening. Um, but he, of course, was not able to undo it, nor did he try to undo it once he got back into town. So Myers chose not to run for mayor in 1907. And his reputation really had descended to an all-time low. Uh, the new administration even contemplated removing the portrait of Myers that hung in the city council chamber and still hangs in the city council chamber today. A group of Savannah citizens had given the painting to the city in order to commemorate Myers' efforts in building a city hall. Before this administration could find a less auspicious place to place the portrait, an unknown party vandalized the oil painting, carving an X across Meyer's face. <laughs> Council condemned the action, as did the local press. They denounced it as a, quote, cowardly and unseemly act. One overzealous local politician even asserted that, quote, the act was the most infamous piece of vandalism that has been per perpetrated here since Sherman marched through Georgia, which I thought was great. Um, and of course, this was meant to insult Myers, right? It was, it was no mystery, right, who this message was meant for. Um, but such behavior still was not really acceptable in polite circles in Savannah. So the vandalism actually probably ensured its fabulous, illustrious place in council because they fixed the portrait and put it back where it had been before. It would seem unseemly to remove it uh, after all that had happened. So looking back, we can see elements of both personas in Meyer's past, right? We see elements of that political boss, that controlling man who was seeking political power. But we also see the evidence, right, of this city father who really drove the um, modern development of Savannah forward. 
And the fact that he's both things is not so surprising necessarily, and especially not surprising during the 19th century. There was really a mentality among men like Myers at the time that you could do things for your own interests that would also benefit everybody else. Um, that you know, while enriching yourself, you could enrich everyone for the common good. But I think standing in this building, we can sort of feel, and you know, looking at the remnants of the modern city that Myers helped build, that his legacy as a city father is definitely one of the most enduring legacies that he has in the city of Savannah, even as his portrait and its history remind us the complexity of his and, of course, of the city's past. So thank you. That's it. Um, and I look at Herman Myers obviously quite a lot. Yes. <laughs> quite a lot. And the, the portrait is fake. I mean, it's going to, <coughs> all you see now is basically the little tiny thing. And, and I'm on a mission to have it restored. And, and I really want to do that. Um, I have already approached the Jewish community in Savannah about the possibility of, of, mm -hmm. of that happening, of them um, putting something into it. So I guess my question to you is a couple things. I mean, are they, <coughs> they want to do some research as well. Uh, a whole ton of questions. Um, if, if the JEA wanted you to come and, and give this talk to their Thursday lectures, would you be willing to do that? Sure. sure. <laughs> um, are there any books written on Herman Myers? Does he ever... Ever, I'm hoping that. mine will be the first. Yeah, so <laughs> um, it, there is there is a extensive master's thesis on Herman Myers and his administration in Savannah. Um, it's written quite a few years ago. Doesn't have the same sort of secondary source mm -hmm. um, influence that you know we like uh, as mm -hmm. historians. And some of the citations I've had trouble sort of corroborating. Uh, but there is a lot of great information in there. Um, I've also done a lot of work on Myers and his past. Um, but no, there isn't a lot of discussion of him. There's a lot of discussion of streetcars in Savannah and this whole issue of the boycott of streetcars, because what I didn't mention, right, is when the streetcar ordinance passes in 1906, there's a year-long boycott of the streetcars um, that eventually ends, but it's this incredible sort of last major action, because um, Savannah was one of the last segregated streetcars in the country. Um, so there's a lot written on that and about the political context related to that. But there really isn't a lot written on Savannah in this particular period of time and therefore about Myers. So. Okay. Um, his connection to the Jewish community, was he um, affiliated with his, a synagogue and was he married by a rabbi? Yes. So in his first marriage, he was married by two rabbis, including the Mikveh Israel rabbi, and that's the, the temple to which he belonged. Okay. Um, and I believe his, his second wife was also Jewish, and, and I believe they were also married by a rabbi, but it was sort of a... The marriage sort of, they, they left town and didn't tell anybody they were getting married and then got married. So it was sort of a bizarre situation. We don't know all that much. We, I think they were married in Virginia, if I recall correctly. Myers was a part of Temple Mikvah Israel, but he was not an active member in the religious sense. So he helped them build the Mikvah Israel Temple that's there today. He helped raise money. Um, he has a, had a pew, you know, he had bought a pew there. Um, and was definitely sort of involved in the social circles in the Jewish community. And he was talked about a lot in the couple Jewish newspapers that run in the South. Um, but he was not, you know, he doesn't come up in terms of serving within the temple for religious purposes. Yeah, well, I think he was rather busy doing other things. He was, yeah. And I think he, he was, you know, his, even his approach to politics, he was all about sort of finance and he just sort of had a, sort of a secular approach to things, I think. So he, he would have participated in that religious life because that was standard in, in that time period. You know, if he wanted to be like his Christian uh, fellows, who everyone belonged to a church, et cetera, et cetera. So he, he kept up that part. But I don't, I don't think, yeah, he, he didn't have a super right. deep. Right. The first wife was not Jewish, but the second wife was No, this, they're both Jewish. They're they were both, both They were both Jewish, yeah. I missed that part, and I apologize. That's OK. Um, the, um, so they're both Jewish. OK, good. And then, um, uh, I guess following along on that, um, or more to kind of the context of, of, of the times, um, who could vote and who couldn't at, at that point in time? Well, the, the electorate was pretty restricted. So obviously only men. Mm -hmm. um, and then there had already been a series of laws that had been restricting voting in Georgia for quite a while. Now, there, was, there were African Americans voting, but they were not commensurate with their place in the population, so their, their voting power had been significantly reduced. Um, I, can, I can provide you with the percentages I know. Mm -hmm. um, 
it was not a lot. It was, it was a pretty small percentage of the population that was actually active in politics. But we do get the sense in the late 19th century that even if people couldn't necessarily cast votes, that they were still involved in the political culture. So there were lots of public rallies and meetings that had you know, pretty big crowds that they drew, even as people didn't necessarily vote in the election. What also complicates the story is that at this time period, they liked people to register separately for all these different elections. So you had separate registration processes for the city and the county state elections. And at each stage, you, you know, had to get through the whole process. You know, there were all these fights at the registration office because they might only be open four days prior to that round of elections. So that was part of the process of keeping the electorate kind of small. <laughs> um, so I mean, I can give you numbers. But it was, not, it was not a big proportion, but it was predominantly white. There were ethnic groups that had various you know, stakes in it. And there was a lot of discussion of different ethnic and racial groups. Uh, How big was Savannah at the time, and what were kind of the boundaries? Have any idea? Um, you may. Uh, give you the corporate limits. Mm -hmm. Our southern boundary was 52nd Street. The, the eastern and western boundaries, the, uh, eastern was about the road, um, a little bit further east, um, you know, Wheaton Street. The western boundary was actually pr pretty far out because it incorporated a lot of the industrial area that we have might just jump back to your comment about the conservation work that's needed on the portrait. That is part of the municipal archives collection, and it has been on our list of things that need conservation work, both the painting and the frame, which is beautiful. And a few years back, we did have it appraised, which was really interesting because they used a uh, black light where you could see the damage oh, really? from the slashing wow. that you can't see, and also, um, one of the things we were going to suggest after this is to go over and look at the portrait, but if you get up close to the portrait, it doesn't look like a very good portrait, and I think a lot of that is from the damage and then the repair by the artist who was not the original artist. Um, so his face is kind of muddy and muddled up. So we do have that on our, <laughs> our list of things that need work, so we can talk more about that. Okay, good, because I'm going to need an estimate. I'm going to go out. Yeah, it needs to be put out for yeah, yeah um, and, and I have population numbers and all sorts of stuff. I, don't, I haven't committed them all to memory, but... So, what, where is that portrait from? That's the same portrait? Yeah, no, that's... that's a, there, there are no other portraits existing. Um, no, we have photographs of him. Mm -hmm. um, that's the only no portrait. It's interesting. He, a, he actually commissioned the portrait. He paid uh, about $2,000. The artist was a Scotch artist named Ambrose DeBar McNeil. He had it hung in City Hall in time for the opening, which was January 2nd, 1906. And I actually have a quote. So the, um, that was in the newspaper, and uh, it says the portrait of Mayor Myers, only recently finished by Mr. Ambrose McNeil, the Scotch artist, attracted a good deal of attention in the council chamber. The mayor, this, I think this is hysterical. The mayor was somewhat embarrassed by having several ladies tell him that it did not do him justice, <laughs> <laughs> that it, he was much handsomer than the picture showed him to be. But, but he had it hung in the exact location it is. Now and I think that says a little bit about him. Yes, absolutely. Um, and it also the fact that it was it's hung on an exterior wall for over a hundred years now is part of why we have some of the problems with flaking mm -hmm. because it has had all of the fluctuations with temperature and humidity from that exterior wall. So and it's never been restored? No. no. Except for where, the slasher story. Where did he live and where was where was the grocery store? So the grocery store, we, we actually talked about the, the building. It was demolished. We think, Luciana, we, we talked about his Savannah grocery building. Wasn't it demolished in the, we said the 30s, we thought? Yes. 30s or 40s? It was on Bay Street. Um, so it was a very central it's location. It's actually the site of the Hyatt. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and he actually lived for a long time at the DeSoto Hotel. So the DeSoto actually had uh, quarters that he rented and suggestion being that he wanted to stay, you know, in sort of the, the business heart of the city. Absolutely. Yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> yes. Were there any uh, interesting facts about the remainder of his life once he was out of office? Did he get involved in anything? He unfortunately didn't live very long. He actually died in 1909. Um, so he, of some sort of stomach illness. Um, so he actually was only married a few years and didn't do much and, and was ill for a lot of his post um, 
after his time in office. I think we actually have some, you brought some photos. Um, when he died, he had this incredible state funeral. And he, you know, was taken through the streets of Savannah. There are pictures of the cortege. And he, was he in state in City Hall? So, um, his, they, the council um, passed a resolution. They lowered the flags to have staff. They draped City Hall in mourning, which one picture shows City Hall draped. Um, his casket was placed in the chamber under his portrait. Um, and you see the one picture shows it banked in flowers. Um, it was placed with armed guards. The building was open for two days where citizens were allowed to pass in it. And that's one of the stories we tell, which is kind of in, in conflict with this picture of when he left office and, mm -hmm. you know, of, of sort of this corruption failing where, you know, two years later, we're sort of revering him at that point. So for two days he lays in state here and then he leaves in a funeral procession with a portion on part to go to make the Israel and then on the Bonaventure. So the, the story we've always told is really in relation to the great city hall and mm -hmm. how he's laid in state here. And, and it's, so it's interesting for me to hear some of the other stories. Which were, in, in fairness to him, pretty, also pretty common in late 19th century city politics. I mean, this was a time of machine politics, of a lot of corruption. Um, but I do think it's important for us to think about sort of that juxtaposition and the fact that we remember him in this way, that, that really we should understand that it's, that it's more nuanced um, and he was not necessarily always as beloved um, as he currently is uh, in Savannah. I should add, the pictures that are going around are a special series. It was like a 14-set um, bound series of images, all from his funeral, that are in the Savannah Jewish archives. So they're not from our collections. But it's a beautiful, like, special, mm -hmm. like, folio collection from his funeral. And the, the flowers uh, in Mikveh Israel and in that picture, I mean, were just incredible. And also there's pictures of his gravesite at Bonaventure, which, of course, nothing was around it. Um, and Bonaventure at the time. It's pretty, it's pretty neat. Yeah. I just wanted to ask, maybe you already answered, did he have any children? No. And what made you choose to focus on him? Um, well, I was in college and I was, became very interested in Southern history and I started reading about Savannah and, you know, being a Californian, I'll admit it, being from California, I really didn't know that much about the South and I was shocked by the diversity of the South and there were these different, especially in Savannah, there were all these different ethnic community, there were Jews in the South and, you know, all these different people um, and so I found it just very fascinating, this, this context that, uh, in which he was mayor. Um, and it's interesting to me that there was a period in Southern history where you had Jews and other ethnic minorities who were serving in prominent positions in government. And then by World War I, most of them no longer really had access to those positions because of rising anti-Semitism. So it's also this sort of interesting window uh, in American history where you have sort of a broader group of people who were able to, to have political power than, than later in the century. So I don't know. I mean, why, I just find it fascinating. And also, Savannah is a really beautiful place to do research. So <laughs> <laughs> there's that. Um, but yeah, I just found him an interesting character. He doesn't have kids. Um, his, there, some of his siblings have descendants, um, some of which live in Savannah today. Um, of course, the fact that he doesn't have descendants made researching him pretty difficult. That's why I became such friends with the Municipal Archive, because my access to him was basically through newspapers and public records because there is no real manuscript collection um, of his. And I also, a major person in my research who I don't have time to talk about today and is not directly related to this, was it's a newspaper editor of the Savannah Tribune, an African-American newspaper. And he was really fascinating to me and his commentary on Myers and discussion of the local political context is a huge part of my work. Uh, he also doesn't have children. <laughs> so I, of course, ended up in this situation where there are no manuscript records and no descendants of the two main people I focus on. Um, so it has been an exercise in creative use of source material. Um, but it, it's been interesting. And it's interesting to sort of go on that detective work kind of project and sort of trying to find the glimpses of who he was through the tipping of the hat, through the commissioning and placing his own portrait in City Hall, to you know the scandalous divorce. Um, I think that was the, the most interesting thing I uncovered about him. I ha read nothing about it. It's nowhere. But you go and look at the probate records, and there it is. And then you go and you look um, in the newspaper, and all of a sudden, there's this fantastic wedding. And so it was kind of, that was a, that was a fun discovery. <laughs>